helping uh, each of the uh, business owners with all their tax compliances, uh, incorporation of their entities, and uh, tax advisory. So this is a, a very good platform uh, for uh, all coffee enthusiasts. Uh, I would uh, like to thank Mr. Praveen for giving me this opportunity. So we've been uh, constantly interacting with a lot of startups at Coffee Board and understand that the uh, business model and uh, also sharing my bit of uh, expertise in terms of taxation, finance and advisory. So this is a comprehensive presentation on uh, various compliances uh, that will be applicable to all the uh, businesses. And uh, when someone is looking to uh, register their business uh, with the statutory authorities, uh, there will be various options to incorporate their companies. The uh, option uh, that will be available and the most favorable for uh, a business owner to select the correct uh, structure while incorporating a business. So I'll be uh, dealing with each one of these uh, topics today and uh, it will be uh, quite a comprehensive one. So I would uh, start my presentation now. So as I said, I will be giving an overview of the various uh, business entity uh, structures. So there are various business entity structures uh, like uh, sole proprietorship, partnership, company, LLP, uh, one person company. So choosing the best uh, entity for your uh, business uh, will be uh, will help you uh, make the uh, business uh, like uh, e easy friendly. Like uh, there, in terms of compliances, you have to choose the best entity. Uh, which suits you in terms of uh, op so it becomes easier for you to focus on your business and not just uh, worry about the uh, constant uh, compliances involved. So this will be the whole uh, objective of this uh, session. So helping you understand the various entity uh, types and uh, choosing the most favorable one based on your business model. After this, uh, the second part would be uh, dealing with the various uh, compliances, tax compliances and various incentives uh, that are available for startups under uh, various government schemes. I'll be giving a brief about uh, that as well at the second part of the uh, session. Many uh, people uh, would not give much importance in registering their startup, but uh, it has various uh, consequences and it has a very uh, big impact. So the uh, most important aspect one needs to while uh, for registering uh, a startup is uh, recognition and credibility in the uh, business ecosystem among the various uh, stake, uh, stakeholders that you deal with. For example, uh, if your company is registered, it becomes easier for, for you to get recognized uh, in the marketplace like uh, e-commerce platform, be it e-commerce platform or when you have to uh, access uh, financial support from uh, financial institutions like banks or when you approach equity investors. So the uh, basic criteria is the recognition and credibility that uh, comes into play only when you have registered your startup. So people will uh, obviously believe you when you have something uh, in place in terms of uh, statutory registration, the required statutory registrations else uh, the credibility will be very less and uh, your entire exercise of uh, approaching uh, various stakeholders for your uh, growing your business becomes futile. And the uh, second uh, part would be access to various government schemes. So when you make an application to any government scheme, you have to re register your startup. So otherwise the, the eligibility uh, itself uh, is lost. So as I said, access to funding, when you approach equity investors or a bank, they ask for all the basic uh, statutory registrations and uh, your financials. Uh, the last part is very important, legal enforceability. So uh, in any, uh, in case of any dispute with your customers or vendors and when a legal uh, battle, registering your startup is inevitable. Uh, otherwise, the court uh, will not accept your application for filing a case. So your case, application will itself will be uh, dismissed. So there will not be an, no opportunity will be given to file a case against any of 
vendors or customers in case of any legal disputes. As I mentioned, there are various uh, business entities. So one is sole proprietorship, second one is partnership firm, third is LLP, and fourth is a private limited company and a public limited company. So usually a private limited company is the ideal situation for any new businesses that are being set up. For, uh, after reaching a certain stage, uh, like raising various rounds of funds from investors, the company will usually uh, convert itself to, into a public company by listing itself on a recognized stock exchange like NSC and BSC. So what are the various factors that one needs to uh, choose uh, before uh, finalizing the business structure? So uh, a business uh, owner, uh, there are various business types. For example, there, there might be uh, various freelancer, like architect, uh, tax consultants, and other uh, professionals. In such a case, a sole proprietorship would be most ideal uh, as uh, there won't be any uh, uh, partners or any other investors involved, it will be uh, solely controlled by a single person. So in the, such cases, the, um, the scale of operations would be uh, minimal and uh, to minimize your uh, compliances, sole proprietorship should be the ideal uh, option. Why, why one needs to choose sole proprietorship is because of uh, sole ownership status and ease of formation. And uh, the transfer of uh, ownership is also uh, very easy. So, and the tax when it comes to taxation, uh, individual uh, slab rates uh, that are applicable for a particular respective uh, financial year that would be applicable. And there is no special uh, rates in terms of taxation. Second is partner. So I see someone asking uh, a, a question. I would take all the questions in the end. So I would uh, explain all the features and uh, characteristics of uh, all the various structures. And then in the end, uh, I would be, uh, I would prefer taking all the questions in the end. In case of partnership, uh, the minimum, uh, requirement is uh, two members to form a partnership. The maximum um, number of members that can be part of partnership is uh, 20. So if you think uh, you have a, a business model where uh, not many members would be required uh, to run, uh, run the business, partnership would be ideal. But this uh, Partnership Act uh, is governed by uh, Partnership Act 1932. So in this case, uh, there is a one uh, major uh, drawback, uh, which is uh, unlimited liability. So in uh, that, this uh, particular feature, I would like to explain what exactly uh, you mean by unlimited liability. Basically, uh, if a partner is uh, um, uh, re responsible for any financial uh, crisis, so all the partners along with the uh, one particular partner who is responsible for financial crisis will be equally responsible jointly responsible for the financial liabilities of that particular business. So there is no limit. Uh, it is uh, unlimited. So this is one of the major drawback in case of partnership. Because of this drawback, I would suggest uh, to partnership firms only when you are having your close family members, uh, like immediate uh, family members, when you are having a spouse or a brothers or your father or mother as your partner, only then I would uh, recommend having partnership firm. Usually family owned businesses uh, opt for partnership firm. Uh, so otherwise, uh, have, uh, entering into a business with an unknown uh, person uh, would be very uh, risky if you are going for a partnership firm. So in, uh, to, our, to mitigate this risk, uh, we will be uh, suggesting to go with LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. It is gone by a different act, LLP Act, and there uh, this uh, feature uh, has been tweaked in uh, to ensure uh, to avoid unlimited liability for uh, all the partners. So there the liability of each partner will be restricted to the extent of the amount invested by him. Suppose a, a partner has invested 10 lakhs. So his liability is uh, uh, limited only to that extent. He will not be responsible for any uh, 
thing beyond his investment. That is a major uh, difference between a, a regular partnership firm and a limited liability partnership. So in terms of taxation uh, between partnership firm and LLP, uh, there is no uh, difference. It is a uh, tax at flat 30%. There is no slab uh, structure in case of a uh, sole proprietorship. So it is attached at a flat rate of 30%. Coming to the next uh, structure, that is a company, a private limited company, where the minimum number of uh, members is, uh, required to form a company is uh, two uh, in case of a private limited company. And uh, the, in addition to uh, the members, the shareholders, like we will uh, need two directors. The directors can be the same uh, shareholders or it can be uh, a, a different uh, set of directors. People can be appointed as directors in case of a company. So minimum requirement is two shareholders and two directors and shareholders and directors can be the same. It need not be different. So, uh, in uh, case of a company, the major uh, feature that is there is separate legal entity. What is separate legal entity? Separate legal entity means um, the ownership and the management uh, is uh, different. So in case of a uh, proprietorship and partnership, there is no such concept. Only in case of a company that is different. For uh, as I said, like the shareholders can be different, directors can be different. So uh, shareholders can be just investors, and uh, directors are the one are the people key people involved in the day to day operations of the business. And um, Company is itself by itself is considered as a separate entity and the shareholders are considered uh, different from the company. So if any, in, in case of any uh, legal disputes that will uh, be directly uh, dealt with the company and not with the shareholders. So uh, this is the major uh, aspect of separate legal entity. In case of sole proprietorship, suppose whenever there is any dispute, it will be uh, taken up directly with the um, uh, people involved in the uh, proprietorship or a partnership. In case of a company, it will be directly uh, dealt with the directors of the company and not uh, with the shareholders. So this is the uh, primary uh, idea of separate legal entity. And here as well, the limited liability concept is applicable just like the limited liability partnership. Uh, in, uh, so there is no concept of unlimited liability. As I said, corporate governance. So here the management can be uh, handled. Day to day operations can be handled by directors and uh, the shareholders uh, need not involve. So this is the major uh, difference uh, from company to a partnership firm. In a partnership firm, the partners are directly involved in the operations of the business and they are the owners. I think someone started sharing their screen. Uh, Sashank, uh, you can uh, share the screen. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yeah, visible. Yeah. So, and another main feature of companies perpetual succession. So, the uh, shareholders may come and go, but the company will uh, go on forever. That is the saying uh, in case of perpetual succession. In case of a sole proprietorship and partners, like as soon as the demise of the sole proprietor or a partner, the uh, existence will cease. In case of a company, uh, the shareholders, uh, in case of any demise or any uh, unfortunate incident, it will be transferred uh, from uh, to their legal heirs and the existence of the company remains unaffected. So the company existence will not be at stake in, ca uh, in case of any uh, demise of the uh, shareholder. So that is another advantage. So one need not have to worry about uh, setting up uh, things from the scratch. So the company existence will uh, remain intact. When it comes to taxation, uh, there are various incentives uh, and uh, there is a concessional rate uh, compared to partnership firm. So the major advantage for small companies whose turnover is uh, less than 400 crores is 25% uh, and uh, 
this is a very good uh, incentive given by the government. There is a reduction in the rate of to the tune of five percent compared to partnership firm, and there are certain um, if in case of establishing any new uh, manufacturing entity, uh, further concession, and it the uh, fifteen percent would be the applicable rate uh, for the first five years, and then thereafter uh, uh, it. Uh, there's a concession and then it the normal rates would apply and there are also other uh, uh, specific entities for which uh, concession rate of 22 percent is applicable so in general 25 percent is the applicable rate for private limited companies so as i said public company is something one needs to uh, uh, opt for it only at the stage of uh, floating an IPO or and getting listed on stock exchange. Until then, uh, one need not worry about uh, evaluating this option. So a private company, as I said, it should have minimum number of members as two and maximum is 200. So this will give a cushion of having more uh, investors uh, compared to partnership. Uh, this will have flexibility to invite more uh, investors and uh, gather, like uh, we can raise more capital in case of a private limited company uh, since the number of members can be uh, involved up to 200 instead of 20. So this is one uh, uh, comprehensive table which will uh, give you an idea of uh, the ma major pros and cons of various uh, entities that we discussed so far. So in case of sole proprietorship, the formation becomes very easy and uh, even uh, the decision making, uh, the flexibility of operations, these are the major advantages. In, uh, when it comes to disadvantages, uh, uh, like both partnership firm and sole proprietorship will have unlimited liability. and. Uh, since the number of investors involved in case of sole proprietorship and partnership firm is very uh, limited, the potential to raise capital is very uh, minimal. In case of a company, uh, we can raise capital from uh, the base of uh, members is up to 200. So it uh, gives you an advantage and leverage to raise more capital. So expansion becomes very difficult in case of sole proprietorship and partnership or in case of a company, expansion is easier because of the uh, invest, uh, ability to raise more capital. So in case of a company, the governance is also different. As I said, we can have uh, subject matter expertise as uh, the directors who can take care of the operations more efficiently rather than uh, uh, involving the owners of the company uh, in day-to-day -day op operations. We can have uh, experts involved in the day-to-day -day operations to the business uh, higher. In case of proprietorship and partnership, uh, such advantages are uh, not uh, prevalent. And the existence of uh, proprietorship and partnership uh, will be uh, disturbed in case of any uh, uh, retirement of a partner or in case of any death demise of partners or sole proprietor. However, in companies, the, there is a concept of perpetual section, succession, which we already discussed. So now that we have understood the, uh, the various, uh, salient features of the various uh, business structures, so I'll explain the incorporation process involved uh, and the ease of it. For a sole proprietor, we need to just apply for PAN and have a bank account in our uh, in the uh, name of sole proprietor. Uh, po uh, after having this basic uh, document, we can uh, directly go ahead with uh, GSC registration and MSME registration. GSC registration uh, and we take it is an optional uh, registration uh, based on the threshold limits uh, that a business achieves. Suppose uh, in case of a service uh, provider, his threshold limit uh, is uh, below 20 lakhs per annum, then he need not apply for GSC registration. Uh, in case of a um, merchant uh, who is uh, who is involved in uh, trading of goods completely and the turnover does not uh, exceed beyond 40 lakhs, he need not apply for GSA registration. 
So MSM registration is a very relatively uh, simple registration, very straightforward, which will uh, give certain benefits when we access uh, for uh, funding from banks uh, in terms of concessional rating. And there are also new uh, amendments in Income Tax Act where uh, if someone who has registered under MSME, the payments uh, to MSME from their vendors has to be from their customers uh, needs to be honored uh, within 45 days. Else uh, their uh, payments to these MSMEs will be disallowed and they need to pay tax on that. So it is a very big move uh, by the government to safeguard MSMEs. So in case of partnership firm, uh, we have to choose a name of the firm. Then we need to decide a place and uh, have a rental agreement for uh, that particular premises. And this has to be uh, submitted. Uh, these rental agreement and partnership deed has to be submitted to income tax department for applying of PAN. And then once PAN is available, then we can go ahead and get the partnership firm registered with register of firms. It is a very important important step one needs to consider like after having partnership deed and rental agreement and plan that is that itself will not be sufficient registering your firm becomes very important as i said uh, for the purpose of legal enforceability uh, the other option now going to the next entity is llp here uh, sin, uh, the process is uh, sub, uh, like uh, very different because it is gone by a different act uh, llp act so this is uh, something we uh, need history of corporate affairs at a central government level. So there is a website called uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs, mca.gov.in. We need to initiate the process of incorporation from that website. Everything is online. Uh, it requires um, professional help uh, to fill all the requirements of the uh, application process. So we need to uh, apply for a name and uh, if it is available, it will be uh, assigned to you. Then uh, you can uh, make an application of uh, incorporation in the same website. You need to draft an LLP agreement uh, beforehand uh, to upload it in the portal. So once the incorporation application is um, approved, then you will be receiving a unique uh, number called LLP identification number so which uh, is a very uh, important uh, it, so in case of llp the another advantage is you can have a unique name in case of partnership and sole proprietorship the uniqueness is not there like uh, anyone can have a similar name corporate uh, business with uh, similar name and becomes uh, difficult to manage in case of llp we can have a a unique name and also apply for a uh, trademark for uh, better uh, safeguarding your brand name. The company uh, process is also very similar. It has to be done through MCA website. Here also it is very similar. Like we need to first apply for the name and uh, once the name is reserved, we can apply with the incorporation form. We need to have a draft of MOU and uh, AOA, AOA ready for the incorporation application moa and aoa are the uh, major uh, uh, parent documents just like partnership deed for a partnership firm and llp deed for a llp agreement for a llp company uh, moa and aoa will have all the uh, aspects uh, covering about the major objectives of the business uh, who it talks about the it's like a uh, preamble uh, like for uh, like just like a uh, constitution of India like we, it's like the constitution uh, that we uh, prepare for our own company to cover all the aspects of operations the rights responsibilities um, it is the uh, one-time document that we will be drafting so we need to be very careful and take a professional help while uh, deciding the various uh, clauses in memorandum of association and articles of association So post incorporation, uh, we'll be receiving uh, a certificate uh, of incorporation from ROC. ROC is the main uh, person who will be uh, registering, who will be approving our registration for a company and L LLP.
so like as i said like plan is a very important uh, basic document basic requirement while uh, incorporating any uh, business or uh, a sole for a sole proprietor so in case of a company uh, there is one comprehensive form which will uh, also parallelly apply for pan tan and uh, gst registration in case of a company that privilege is there in case of partnership and llp we have to apply for all this uh, registration separately once the company is incorporated only once partnership and llp is incorporated only then we can apply for pan and other uh, gst registration in case of a company it will be a one single comprehensive form called spice form which will uh, help you get all the required registration in one go even pf and esi numbers are also generated by default for a, in case of a private limited company pan is a unique uh, number account number which is allotted by income tax department this uh, number will uh, facilitate you to fi uh, to file your uh, regular uh, annual uh, taxes with the income tax department which is uh, required for filing your taxes and in case of uh, any um, it this it is acts as a identity proof for various other uh, requirements like opening a bank account and uh, it is a very important kyc document for various business transactions and pan can be applied through a tin nsdl website it can be online uh, through other uh, authentication or it the other, offline mode can also be opted if you have some discrepancy in your other uh, details and uh, then you we need to proceed with offline uh, application so the next after obtaining all the registration and uh, incorporating your uh, company gst registration is something we need to uh, evaluate if it is uh, mandatory for our business as i said the threshold limits for uh, service service provider is 20 lakhs per annum for goods uh, trading uh, some into trading of goods 40 lakhs is the threshold limit per annum for availing gsc registration so gsc registration can be applied uh, after having so my audible like uh, they got a prompt saying some network issue it's audible session yeah audible. sure so GSC registration is something uh, we need to decide based on the threshold limits mentioned here. So after uh, if, for uh, upload for GST PAN, because uh, PAN is the basic requirement, like our GST and PAN gets interlinked. So base, uh, basis of PAN, uh, GST number will be allocated. So for if you observe any GST number, it will have our uh, PAN uh, as part of the, uh, the GST number. So this is a very important um, uh, set so, uh, like important step taken by the government to interlink uh, our income tax and uh, gst details so suppose so we have to be very careful so if we have to, uh, declaring a turnover of 10 lakhs in our gst returns and if we are declaring uh, 5 lakhs in our as our income in uh, uh, income tax portal the department uh, will uh, easily catch hold of such discrepancies everything is online and interlinked so even aadhar has been uh, linked to our pan so all the details that we uh, transact through our bank account everything is uh, automatically uh, linked and it is uh, ref it gets reflected in a portal called ais in income tax so we have to be very transparent and uh, we have to make all the submissions uh, diligently to our uh, tax professional else we will be served with uh, notices uh, for these discrepancies. So GST registration uh, can be applied through a GST portal with uh, uh, requirements of uh, PAN and uh, KYC documents of uh, the partners or company based on the structure we opt for. And we need to upload the rental agreement uh, for the premises of the registered office. We need to mention the major uh, categories of uh, business that uh, this entity will be dealing with. So there is something called HSN code, we, uh, which will uh, 
which is allotted based on the uh, category of the business that de that we deal with. So HSN code is uh, available for each uh, different uh, product, different service uh, activity. So we need to choose that very carefully while applying for GSC registration. Suppose we are dealing with uh, coffee, we need to select the appropriate HSN code. Uh, if we are uh, making a wrong choice, then we need to make uh, necessary amendments in the registration. Else, um, you, your registration will be reflecting that you are uh, dealing with coffee. And if you are dealing with uh, tea, then uh, there will be a discrepancy and there, it might be an issue in future. Uh, even there is a audit or a, no, a notice of scrutiny from the GST department. TAN is a number, unique number allocated uh, by the income tax department for the purpose of deducting uh, TDS. TDS is something we need to deduct uh, for all the major uh, transactions that a business uh, goes through. For example, if we are paying a rent to our landlord more than 20,000 per month, we need to deduct TDS. If you are making any pro professional uh, fee, uh, fee payments more than 30,000 per annum, we need to deduct TDS. So if we have a transporter who is uh, rendering service and his bill uh, amount exceeds 1 lakh in a year, we need to deduct TDS. So anything, most of the transactions that a business uh, goes through will have a TDS implication. So when we deduct TDS and uh, after remit, remitting that deducted uh, tax amount to the department, we need to file a TDS return once in a quarter. So with help of TAN number, we have to code this TAN number at the time of remitting TDS to the department and also at the time of filing TDS return to the department. So this is a important requirement uh, like which most people are not unaware of. If we do not deduct TDS, the implication uh, will be very severe. There are uh, mo most of the expenses for which TDS is applicable and if not deducted, then such expenses will be disallowed and you will be asked to pay tax on it. So this is a very uh, important uh, aspect one needs to keep in mind while uh, <clears throat> having your business. So there are other registrations, as I mentioned, apart from the basic uh, statutory registration, MSME registration, FSSI registration, IEC registration, ICE gate, Startup India registration. So I'll be explaining each of these uh, registrations, why it is required and for whom it is applicable. So MSME uh, registration, as I said, like uh, as per MSME Act, MSME, there are there are three categories, micro, small and medium enterprises. So each of the uh, categories have been defined. What is the uh, eligibility uh, criteria for it to be recognized as micro and small and medium enterprise? In case of a manufacturing enterprise, uh, if the investment is not uh, exceeding 25 lakhs, then they are considered as micro enterprises. And between 25 lakhs to 5 crores, they are considered as small enterprise. If it, the investment exceeds five crores and not, does not exceed 10 crores, it is considered as a medium enterprises. In case of a service enterprises, the threshold limits are different as, that are being mentioned in this slide. So if we are falling in, under any of these categories, then we can go ahead and apply for uh, Udyam registration. It is called Udyam Aadhaar. Uh, it, with the help of uh, the basic details of our business like uh, PAN, Aadhaar, and uh, details of our premises and our investment details, and uh, apply and uh, get this uh, registration. This will help us in various ways, like getting concessional rate of interest from banks. And I also mentioned about the recent amendment. Uh, so it will help you uh, receive funds from your customers uh, efficiently without any uh, prolonged uh, there is it ensures that your payment cycle is smooth. You can receive your uh, re uh, payments from outstanding payments from your customers on time without any uh, unreasonable delays. FSSAI is again uh, a license which is a, uh, issued by uh, 
at a central level and state level and also a basic registration is uh, issued. There are three types of uh, uh, registration. One is the basic registration and one is a uh, state FSSI license and the third one is central FSSI license. So in case of a small uh, merchant, like a, a small uh, a cafe owner, they can have a FSSI registration in case of a uh, manufacturing uh, unit medium size manufacturing unit they need to opt for a state fssi license in case of a big uh, larger enterprise who will be involved in exports or having uh, operations across various states they will have to opt for central fssi license so requirement for each of these licenses will be slightly different uh, i have not explained the uh, details of it but these are the basic three uh, categories which are uh, applicable for uh, different businesses and FSA license is primarily for someone who is uh, dealing with uh, food uh, and beverage for someone who is in food f and b industry food and beverage industry and the next is iec import export code so for someone who wants to start uh, trade uh, globally, like in wheat import or export from uh, any uh, nations, we need to have this IEC. So this IEC can be up, uh, applied with uh, uh, DGFT, which is a uh, director general of foreign trade. So it is an online application. Again, we need to have uh, the basic uh, details in place. Like uh, we need to furnish our pa uh, basic plan, um, uh, nature of business. And we need to furnish our bank uh, details through a cancel check or a recent bank statement. And we need to mention about the partners and promoters involved. So with these basic uh, details, uh, we will be able to apply for IEC code. And it is completely online. We need to have a digital signature if we have to do it uh, completely online. If we have to apply it online, we need to have a digital signature. With, uh, it is also a unique code which will be based on our PAN. So earlier there used to be a separate unique code issued for IEC. Now our PAN itself will be given as an IEC code. After availing IEC, the next step is ICE gate registration. This is essential for custom clearance. So in case of export or import, we will have to undergo the compliances at with the customs department for uh, discharging uh, custom duty and uh, GST in case of imports. So this is the website which will uh, take care of the custom clearances, discharge of the necessary duties like GST and customs. Uh, this uh, we will have to have an account with IceGate online, which is an online uh, account. So these uh, various uh, documents like shipping bills and um, bill of entry all these uh, details will get uh, updated uh, in this portal against our uh, account for the transaction that we have uh, done in case of import and export so a very important uh, account which it is mandatory for any importer or exporter and you might have heard of startup india scheme so it is a government initiative they have uh, there is most of the startups which are uh, in operation for uh, less than uh, 10 years from the date of incorporation, they will be uh, eligible to apply for Startup India recognition and the turnover should not exceed 10, 100 crores in any of the financial years since its incorporation. So these are the basic uh, prerequisites for availing startup recognition under Startup India scheme. After registering under Startup India, we will be eligible uh, to get an access for various uh, incentives uh, and tax uh, concessions. You, for example, uh, if you are applying for trademark, if you are recognized under uh, uh, Startup India, you will be uh, your government fees will be available at a concessional rate. Uh, there are also uh, after availing Startup India recognition, you will also need to apply for a income tax uh, tax holiday so certain categories of business are given a exemption of income tax for five uh, con continuous five years after availing that recognition so just by availing startup india recognition you will not be eligible for uh, income tax holiday only uh, 
there has to be a, there is a separate process to avail that uh, income tax uh, exemption but as per my experience and uh, the current uh, statistics it is given only for uh, tech based startups and it has not been given for manufacturing entities as such only te tech enabled innovative uh, startups ventures have been awarded uh, the tax holiday of 5 uh, years So there are various other uh, benefits apart from tax benefits. The uh, various compliances uh, can be self-certified. Does not require uh, any professional attestations. So and also in case of uh, access to funding, uh, you will be given a platform to participate in uh, investor forums. So there are various opportunities which you can uh, stay tuned by following the Startup India website. So in addition to the various compliances discussed earlier, there are also some of the uh, state specific uh, compliances involved in, in case of uh, uh, labor department, we need to have shop and establishment uh, certificate and trade license to be availed from the local uh, municipal authority, which is BBMP in case of Bangalore. And in case of um, other labor compliances, uh, there are other compliances like ESI, PF, PT. So ESI, PF, PT is optional. Like uh, as I said, like there are certain threshold limits. In case suppose a business enterprise has employees more than ten numbers, then ESI becomes mandatory. And again, if the employee salary is beyond uh, twenty-one thousand per month, they are not eligible for ESI scheme. They will be eligible only for um, private insurance. So in case of PF provident which is provident fund this applicability is uh, mandatory only when the enterprise has more than 20 employees so in case of pt which is professional tax if an employee is uh, drawing salary of more than 25000 per month we need to deduct 200 rupees as professional tax per month from the salary and that needs to be re remitted to the um, professional tax uh, department of karnataka so trademark registration uh, is something which is uh, not mandatory, but it is it helps you in the long run to protect your safeguard your uh, brand name and logo design to be unique and there will not be any uh, risk of someone stealing your uh, identity. So, so that is something you can consider uh, at the initial stages itself and it is not a very uh, expensive process. We need to file a, an application with uh, government for a trademark, which will cost you around uh, twelve to fifteen thousand initially. And if there are any objections uh, or any similar names uh, in the uh, market, then there will be uh, additional uh, cost. Uh, we need to pay uh, the legal advocate to uh, make the necessary submissions and make our arguments, present our arguments and get the name registered in our favor. So I have completed uh, the, uh, all the aspects of uh, structures of various uh, entities and the various compliances. So if you, now we can take up all the uh, questions uh, if you have whatever questions that you have and whatever challenges that you have been facing uh, to handle compliances or to uh, go about the incorporation process i'll be able to assist you you may start posting your questions thank you yeah participants either you can uh, unmute yourself and ask questions directly to uh, mr sushant or you can put your questions in the chat box you will pick it up from there uh, hi, uh, this is uh, Bopana here. Question on the last slide about uh, labor license. Okay. Uh, I just missed that point. Uh, labor license, is it mandatory? For, uh, for example, I'm an OPC, one person okay. company. Okay. So, um, uh, how does uh, labor license is, when you say mandatory, do you also have to apply for it or it's not required because it's only one person? So, oh, what business are you into, sir? Exactly. Can you please exports? Explain? Export of coffee. Export of coffee and uh, how many labors do you employ uh, for this nature of activity under your payroll? Uh, it, it, under the company, nobody. I'm, I'm just, it's just, I'm handling it all myself. 
so it's okay. essentially i'm a coffee grower also so mm-hmm. um, um, i i buy the green coffee from my family the mother wife and myself included as as a grower then i'm the company okay. is uh, processing the coffee through third parties and then i'm exporting it so there is nobody i don't have any staff uh mm-hmm. for this particular activity so okay, that okay. is so the when you say the compliances label license is mandatory so that was mm-hmm. my question number 1 the sec- related to that is the esi and epf see at the time mm-hmm. of uh, I re- uh, when i register i followed all the most of the points which you have mentioned but i okay. think there was an email which came from this uh, esi and pf which somehow i missed out in the early days when all everything was coming at the same time and then mm-hmm. now i've been getting uh, you know messages from the e- pf people and esi com- uh, department saying that i have not filed yeah. any returns and not registered so yes, how do i yes. dealing my because i i yes. i did not opt out at the time yes. and now after yes. say 18 months how do i do it these are my two related questions yeah I so i chat actually, also but i can just yeah. uh, i can answer yeah. it right now yeah i actually uh, mentioned uh, while explaining the incorporation process so as i mentioned in case of a company or opc by default you will be allotted a pf and esi number so there is no option to opt out while incorporating uh, your company this is a i should say this is a uh, flaw or they should give an opportunity to opt or opt in or opt out there is no such uh, option given by mca it okay. is a very big uh, flaw in the system because of which uh, many assessees are uh, concerned about uh, the same uh, question that you are uh, the same uh, area of concern so it has been an area of concern because the it is uh, reflecting in the pf and esi portal that you have uh, availed a registration but uh, the fact is you are not uh, eligible like you are not supp- you are not required to make right. any compliances so from the date of inception till now if you have not made any uh, if you not created any account on pf or esi portal and if not filed any returns then uh-huh. it is not a matter of concern suppose you have created an account and you have filed a nil return then uh-huh. that means you are uh, supposed to file the returns uh, continuously like if you have started filing uh, any returns we have to continue doing that though you are uh, not supposed to suppose you have not done anything online you have not created any account or anything you can just ignore that message or you can also additionally to safeguard to intimate and convey that you are not eligible you can tell them by default i have been allo- allotted a number but i am not required to uh, comply with or make any uh, file any returns because i do not employ uh, uh, any one uh, beyond uh, my employee strength uh, is not beyond 10 in case of esi and your employee strength is not beyond 20 in case of pf hence uh, i am not uh, filing the uh, not uh, following the compliance you can mention like that i say may not uh, required to abide by the compliance yeah so do i have to send the common letter to both as it do I have to, is there a separate uh, esi and a separate pf portal and you can address so... it separately because the uh-huh. threshold limits are different the departments are different uh-huh. Uh-huh. you can address it like if you are if you can reply it by an email if some officer has uh, sent an email uh, uh-huh. or if it is a standard system generated email you need to reply to the concerned person Uh, by uh, offline or if uh-huh. it is someone who has uh, sent an email uh, from an officer specific officer you can reply to the same email mentioning the facts okay yeah. okay yeah. yeah thank you so much thank you any other question Yeah, Shashank, there was one question uh, earlier asked by one of the participants during the session. Uh, okay. How does an OPC opt out PFSA? That is over. Before that, some. Yeah, that is the uh, discussion we had just now. Yeah, Guru Raj Nayak uh, asked a question, I think. So when you were explaining about the, the types of entities, yeah, how was OPC private limited? how about opc private limited yeah, it is a one basic opc is basically one person company like a sole proprietor having uh, uh, going to opt for a private limited structure opc is not a big uh, success according to me uh, if you uh, are opting if you are planning to be a sole proprietor 
like then you can you might as well uh, continue to be sole proprietor and uh, not opt for opc suppose if you are thinking of raising any external investments or if you want any uh, uh, additional director to take care of your operations then you can opt for an opc opc is uh, something not many people opt for they either go for uh, llp or a private limited company for uh, availing the benefits to the max suppose uh, tomorrow you want to add one more uh, person or raise investments from uh, equity uh, venture capitalists then uh, private limited is most uh, preferred uh, because it can uh, accommodate up to 200 members in case of opc which is not the case so opc is something uh, not preferred accord uh, by most of them however oh if uh, opc is uh, like i said only for the purpose of exports um, uh, i was somehow given to understand it's uh, the least complicated if it is uh, like you said if the intention is uh, if i'm not planning to get any more uh, partners or if i'm not planning to get any correct, more correct. Uh, funding or whatever it is because you know, each operation is different i, I totally get it in the in for a tech yes. startup or something that is very important mm. but for something like mm. what i'm doing so is yeah. opc is is it is there any disadvantage i mean there is no uh, harm there is no uh, harm as such only uh, uh, keeping in mind uh, of the other advantages uh, to opt like if we have to opt for private limited the other advantages are plenty compared to opc so if we have to choose uh, between uh, private limited and opc uh, uh, private limited is more preferable is what i but, meant having yeah. opc is uh, not a disadvantage but uh, there are unnecessary complaints like uh, uh, one needs to understand if someone uh, opting for an opc what is the main uh, primary if someone who is very that need they need to have a uh, private limited company uh, but uh, want to run it like a sole proprietor then opc is an option but very few only few freelancers or uh, con uh, like consultants who work for uh, uh, high like celebrities and mm -hmm. people like that, they might for a better credibility and recognition, they will opt for OPC. So I have seen many fitness trainers, many mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, financial consultants, instead of um, uh, presenting like uh, themselves as a sole proprietor, OPC would uh, be more beneficial. So I mean, that is uh, an advantage. That's it. Yeah, but OPC is also a private limited company, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. The compliances are also little more in case of OPC compared to proprietorship. But so what for, what for to sum we it up, to what, I, what I understand you saying is that a private limited, it gives a little more credibility. Say, for example, even in, yeah. in my case, when if I'm uh, presenting myself to a foreign company for exports and so on. So rather than saying I'm a Correct. property company, uh, Correct. saying Correct. an OPC private limited, it gives Correct. a little more Correct. credibility. Correct. 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 They feel uh, that you are under uh, part of some, you are being regulated under some uh, statutory act. So it gives uh, more credibility for someone uh, looking at you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Makes sense. We had a question. Um, can I ask the question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. So, if I have to move from a proprietorship to a private limited company, um, mm -hmm. would you be able to guide me as to who 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 I can uh, work with? Because uh, I went into a proprietorship because of the overheads of a private limited company. Um, okay. And since I was not looking at adding directors and all of it, I felt that proprietorship would be sufficient. However, okay. one of my understandings was that uh, um, if it's not a private limited company, it cannot become a part of the MSME and uh, startup and all of those things, right? So I don't get any of the benefits for a private limited uh, for a proprietorship. And I want to move it into a private limited company, but uh, like I said, uh, the overheads are many and uh, uh, the fee structure to move it from a proprietorship, uh, it's very confusing when we talk to the chartered accountants, right? They give a very mm. confusing picture. Would be mm. would there be somebody who can simplify it and you know kind of move my company from a pro uh, proprietorship to a private limited? Yeah, definitely I can assist, ma'am. Like I've uh been assisting a lot of startups with this uh, process. Okay. I need to understand uh, your current uh, scale, like scale of operation, the investment that you have made in the proprietorship currently. So based on that, I will be able to suggest uh, the way forward. Okay. So we can like whether to convert proprietorship to or just uh, set up an independent uh, 
private limited company uh, without uh, going through the hassle of conversion. So I need to understand your current scale of operation and investments that you have made in your current uh, proprietorship. So I'll be uh, able to give you the right advice. Yeah. Okay, so um, how do I reach out to you after this? So I'll leave my number and email address. You can make a note in the chat box. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope there are no other questions. So, yes, um, I missed the first half no of the conversation. Sorry, I missed the first half. Um, okay. Will these slides be available for us to take a look at? I missed the first part because I wanted to look at the uh, export, import export okay. Uh, okay. certifications. I do have the import export certifications, but uh, I was okay. not sure about how. Um, yeah, yeah because it's um, done we, for... we will be sharing the uh, recording of this uh, webinar. We will be uploading ah. this into our uh, YouTube channel as well, and the link okay. will be shared with you, madam. So okay. please uh, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, you can contact me personally. You can uh, ping me in WhatsApp. I'll share you the link. Thank so you. I'll so drop much. my uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, Praveen, number uh, in the chat box. Normally, the WhatsApp videos are uh, okay, but it's sometimes having a PDF copy of this. Uh, yeah, that also will be shared. Will be more useful for us. Yeah. So, also also can I share this the in the chat box copy. if uh, possible? Like, is it? Yeah, yeah. So, sir, you can you can send, and also we have uh, emails of all the participants. We'll also send okay. them by email. Yeah, that will sure. be great. If a PDF copy can be shared, thank you. Sure, I'll do that. And uh, I request uh, everyone to uh, switch on your camera. I'll uh, just take a screenshot. For today's participants, please uh, switch on your cameras. Okay, others. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so if there are any questions, you can reach out to us uh, by WhatsApp or by email. So our team will get back to you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Sushan, for the session. And also thank all the participants. Uh, so, Atal Incubation Center of Coffee Board, we are uh, hosting our uh, next batch of Vartaramba program, uh, which is starting from uh, this Monday. So, if anybody is interested, please uh, you can register. The details are available in the chat box, or you can visit our official website of uh, Atal Incubation Center Coffee Board. Once again, uh, thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you.